Hello everyone, um, this is the topic two, water resources analysis and evaluation. Um, in this session, uh, we will start with remote sensing and geographic information system tools. Um, you can, can you remember in the first uh, session, we talked about the hydrologi hydrological cycle. This is a new diagram um, produced by the USGS, the U United States Geological Services. And we talked about uh, the uh, human influence on the uh, hydrological cycle. Um, and we emphasize the necessity of uh, evaluate the water resources and um, to estimate the availability of water resources in the territories where we are working. And in this case, this is a new diagram from the United Nations. Uh, it shows the necessity of global data to uh, promote local action. This is a general framework for water management in the in this at this time when we need to uh, mobilize action and the concept of nature-based solutions uh, is a concept for the new water management paradigm to enhance the nature-based solutions, we need to acquire and uh, analyze global data in order to promote local action. When we talk about global data, uh, we, are, we uh, refer to, for example, satellite images, uh, remote sensing information, different types of sensors that provide us a lot of information uh, to make decisions about our uh, our water resources for example um, this is a general view of the earth this image was taken by by the discover satellite and uh, this image is available uh, on the internet and is available for all the people around the world. We can see um, different type of clouds, cloud formations, uh, different types of um, water transport in the atmosphere. And this is only one of the uh, wide range of uh, satellite products we have for water resources uh, evaluation. What is remote sensing? It's the process of the de detecting and monitoring the physical characteristics of an area by measuring its reflected an emitted radiation at a distance, typically from satellite or aircraft. Special cameras collect remotely sensed images, which help researchers sense things about the air. Some examples are camera cameras on satellites and airplanes take images of large areas of Earth's surface, allowing us to see much more than we can see when standing on the ground. Sonar systems and camera on satellites can be used to make image of temperature changes in the uh, terrain or in the uh, ocean surface. And uh, we have a, a lot of um, specific uses of remotely sensed. For example, at this, in this image, we can see the uh, capital city of Uzbekistan. We can see uh, water reservoirs and uh, field um, 
irrigated uh, fields uh, downstream the reservoir and this is our uh, examples of uh, sp specific uses of remote remotely sensing images for example to monitor large forest fires to uh, tracking clouds to help predict the weather to monitor the growth of a city uh, or the changes in uh, agricultural surface uh, through the years and um, and to, uh, we can use satellite images for to establish digital uh, elevation models uh, of the ocean uh, of the ocean floor of the earth terrain etc we have mentioned sensors mounted on satellites, planes, drones, and ground-based platforms uh, in order to monitor uh, land cover regionally and globally. And now we will talk about uh, how to assess the global water cycle using different types of um, satellite missions. We have this table, we have included programs, organizations, satellites, missions, and the uh, electromagnetic spectrum, the bands, the, the bands uh, which are used by those specific sensors and the different and general characteristics. For example, for the World Weather Watch program operated by the World Meteorolo Meteorological Organization, we can find satellite missions as uh, UMITSAT, Meteosat, GEOS, NOAA 19, etc., etc. Those missions operate in the visible and the infrared spectrum. For example, we can appreciate this image. This image is centered on 0 0.6 micrometers of the visible spectrum. This is a full disk image of Europe and Africa obtained with the Meteosat second generation constellation. This mission is used mainly for meteorological models and predictions. The European Organization for the Exploitation of Meteorological Satellites, UMISTAT, currently operates the Meteosat second generation constellation formed by Meteosat 9, 10, and 11 in geostationary orbit over Europe, Africa, and the Indian Ocean. These, uh, those satellites are located uh, about 36 thousand kilometers over the ground. Meteosat imagery is crucial for now casting, which is about detecting rapid, rapidly developing high impact weather and predicting its evolution a few, hour, a few hours ahead in support of the safety of life and property. Observations are also used for weather forecasting as input to numerical weather prediction models and for climate monitoring. This is another uh, satellite mission called AQUA. It's a Na NASA Earth Science satellite mission named for the large amount of information that the mission is collecting about the Earth's water cycle, including evaporation from the oceans, water vapor in the atmosphere, clouds, precipitations, 
soil moisture, sea ice, land ice, and snow cover on the land and ice. Additional variables also being measured by this satellite include radi ra radiative energy fluxes, aerosol, vegetation cover on the land, phytoplankton, and dissolved organic matter in the oceans and air, land, and water temperatures. And aqua operates in the passive microwave. Now uh, we will talk about the Landsat program. Um, this program provides the longest continuous space-based re record of Earth's land in existence. Landsat data give us information essential for making informed decisions about Earth resources and environment. And here we can see the timeline of the Landsat program starting with the launch of Landsat 1, finishing in Landsat 9. It was launched on September 27 of 2021. And Landsat 9 uh, will continue the legacy of this important and fundamental program. Since the launch of the first Landsat satellite in 1972, the mission's archive has grown to contain than 8 million images. And now uh, most of those images are available to the public and researchers and technicians. And Landsat 9, 9 data uh, will add information to this archive, enhancing our understanding of uh, Earth in different ways, from tracking water use in crops uh, in different parts of the world, to monitoring deforestation in the Amazon basin or in the uh, tropical forest in Africa, South Asia, etc., etc. We can also measure the speed of Antarctic and Arctic glaciers melting and um, the decision makers from across across the globe can use the freely available landside data to uh, better understand the environmental systems and to forecast uh, global and regional crop production and to plan an adequate response to natural disaster and more. In the case of uh, Landsat 9, this satellite captures scenes across a swath 185 kilometers wide. Each, each pixel in these images is 30 meter across, similar to the uh, to a baseball camp or base, baseball uh, court. Its instruments collect images of Earth's landscapes in visible, near and short wave infrared and thermal infrared wavelength. We have to mention that Landsat program is a joint effort of NASA and the US Geological Survey. But Landsat develops a critical role for water since uh, 1972 because Landsat data assist the local and global decision making with four main purposes, locating water resources, assessing water pollution, managing watersheds, and 
allocating water resources. For example, we can see in this image um, the Rio Cauto Delta. Um, this picture was taken in 2020. It's a Landsat 8 image. And um, this picture is a part of a global study uh, of the roots for global mangrove losses, loss. Um, and the Rio Cauto Delta uh, is an international recognized wetland of importance. And uh, this delta is home to numerous species of mangroves. We have to mention a very important sensor uh, and a very important satellite mission operated by, by the National Ocean Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration uh, of the United States. Um, the advanced very high resolution radiometer AVHRR is a cross track scanning system with five spectral bands having a resolution of 1.1 kilometer and a frequency of earth scans twice per day. And for example, in this image, uh, we can see the developing process uh, for the hurricane Andrew. The objective of uh, this instrument is to provide radiance data for investigation of clouds, land water boundaries, snow and ice extent, ice or snow melt inception, day and night cloud distribution, temperatures of radiating surfaces, sea surface temperature and vegetation classification and greenness through passively measured visible near infrared and thermal infrared spectral radiation bands. And it is important to mention the uh, MODIS instrument, uh, MODIS or Moderate Resolution Imaging Spectro Radiometer is a key instrument aboard the Terra and Aqua satellites. We've mentioned previously the Aqua mission and Ter Terra Modis and Aqua Modis are viewing the entire Earth's surface every one to two days, acquiring acquire, acquire data in 36 spectral bands or groups of wavelengths. It is important to consider that Terra's orbit around the Earth is time so that it passes from north to south across the equator in the morning, while Aqua passes south to north over the equator in the afternoon. And um, this data um, improves our understanding of global dynamics and processes occurring on the land, in the oceans, and in the lower atmosphere. Um, MODIS is playing a specific um, 
fundamental role in the development of uh, validated global and interactive earth system models able to predict global change accurately enough to assist policy maker, makers in making, in making sound decision concerning the protection of our environment. And in many uh, environmental uh, emergencies, uh, we can see uh, governmental organizations are assisted by this uh, information, by those information uh, instruments based on Modi's uh, imagery. For example, um, this is an, an image taken uh, on 29 of June of this year. And we can see Hurricane Adrian. Uh, this hurricane became the first hurricane of the 2023 Eastern Pacific hurricane season. And um, we can see this hurricane located uh, off the coast of Southern Mexico. Okay. We are going to talk about the Copernicus program. Um, it is the earth observation component of the European Union space program. Um, looking at our planet and its environment to benefit all European citizens and the global community. It offers information services that draw from satellite air observation and in situ data, uh, non-space data. And we have vast amounts of global data from satellites and ground-based airborne and seaborne measurement systems provide information to help service providers, public authorities, and other international organizations uh, in order to improve uh, European citizens and global community quality of life and beyond. It is important to emphasize that the information services provided are free and openly accessible to users um, distributed across the entire world. And Copernicus services are related with the atmosphere services, marine management, land monitoring and management, climate, climate change, security issues, and emergency issues. The European Space Agency is developing a new family of missions called Sentinels, specifically for the operational needs of the Copernicus program. Each Sentinel mission is based on a constellation of satellites to fulfill revisit and cover coverage requirement, providing robust data sets, data sets, data sets for Copernicus services. 
and these missions carry a wide range of technologies such as radar and multispectral imaging instrument for land, ocean, and atmospheric monitoring. And on the picture on the right, we can see different artifacts um, that belong to the Sentinel family. Um, we are talking about the Sentinel-1, Sentinel-2 satellite, Sentinel-3, Sentinel-4, Sentinel-5B, and the Sentinel-5, and finally, the Sentinel-6. Let's start with the Sentinel, Copernicus Sentinel-1. Um, this mission provides all weather, day and night radar imagery for land and ocean services. The twin satellites Sentinel-1A and Sentinel-1B were respectively launched on April of 2014 and April of 2016. And for example, this is an example of its application. This picture shows how the William Glacier on the Antarctic Peninsula has retreated since 1955, roughly three kilometers in all. The last two retreat lines corresponding to uh, 2016 and 2021 are based on Copernicus Sentinel-1 satellite data. And the very early years before the advent of the satellite era are based on aerial observations. What about Copernicus Sentinel-2? Uh, this mission uh, provides, provides high-resolution optical imagery for land services. It provides, for example, imagery of vegetation, soil and water cover, inland waterways and coastal areas. Sentinel-2 also delivers information for, emergen for emergency services. Uh, there are two satellites, two sat satellites, twin satellites, Sentinel 2A and Sentinel 2B, that were respectively launched on June 2015 and March 2017. For example, these images were acquired by Copernicus Sentinel 2 satellites on two uh, moments, June 2022 and June 2023, the past 14 of June. And these images show the Canelon Grande Reservoir in Montevideo, Uruguay, which is going through an unprecedented water crisis. Uruguay at this moment is facing its worst drought in decades caused by a combination of factors. Precipitation deficits, above average temperatures and recurrent heat waves. And the drought is resulting in a water shortage in the Montevideo metropolitan area where a state of emergency has been declared. Some, new, uh, some newspapers are declaring that Montevideo uh, has reached its own day zero at this uh, opportunity. 
we are worried worried about this situation. What about Copernicus Sentinel-3? Provides this mission provides provi provides high accuracy optical radar and altimetry data for marine and land services. It measures variables such as sea surface topography, sea and land surface temperature, ocean color and land color with high gain accuracy and re reliability. The twin satellites Sentinel-3A and Sentinel-3B were respe respectively respectively launched on February 2016 and on April 2018. UMED-SAT, we mentioned it before, operates the satellites and deliver the marine mi mission while the European Space Agency delivers the land mission. On the right, we have a picture showing the global land surface temperature as measured by Copernicus Sentinel-3. Land surface temperature is an essential climate variable that describe processes such as energy and water exchange between the land surface and atmosphere and plant growth. And this information uh, has be became fundamental uh, to monitor heat waves and other temperature anomalies during the last years in many regions around the world. The Copernicus Sentinel-4 will provide data for atmospheric composition monitoring. Its objective is to monitor key air quality trace gases and aerosols over Europe at high, sp at high spatial resolution with a fast hourly revisit, revisit time. Um, it will be a payload embarked on UMES TA. UMEDSAT's third generation uh, mission and the Copernicus Sentinel-5 will also be dedicated to atmospheric composition monitoring. To be launched in the coming years, it will provide accurate measure measurements of key atmos atmospheric constituents such as ozone, nitrogen, dioxide, sulfur dioxide, carbon mon monoxide, methane, formaldehyde, and aerosol properties. Here we have the Copernicus 5B. Uh, B of uh, means precursor. Um, this is a satellite mission launched on October 2017 uh, to fill the gap and in order to provide the data continuity until the launch of Sentinel-5. Sentinel-5P provides measurements of key atmospheric constituents such as dioxide, um, nitrogen, dioxide, methane, and other atmospheric and atmospheric constituents. For example, um, on the right, we can see the desert dust plume over the Atlantic observed by two satellites, Aelus and Sentinel-5 precursor. The underlying Sentinel 5P aerosol index in fluorescent yellow and green, which indicates the extent of the elevated Sah Saharan dust plume over the Atlantic, 
has been overlaid with information from Aelus aerosol and cloud data. In yellow, parts of the laser light are scattered and absorbed by the Saharan dust. These data are so important for air quality models used by, for example, the Copernicus Atmosphere Monitoring Services. For example, when we have a lot of uh, Sahara dust concentration, it might affect many water sources in our region. That's the reason why it is important to monitor this quality factor, air quality factor. And the Copernicus 6P provides high accuracy altimetry for measuring global sea surface height, primarily for operational ocean oceanography and for climate studies. It is a cooperative mission developed in partnership between Europe the European Union, the European Space Agency, and UMETSAT, and the uh, United States agencies, uh, the National and Ocean Oceanographic Agency, and the and NASA. It was launched in 2020. Copernicus Sentinel-6 is taking on the role of, of radar altimetry reference mission, continuing the long-term records of prior uh, satellite missions. And Sentinel-6 brings, for the first time, a synthetic aperture radar into the altimetry reference mission time series. We can, we've talked about um, many examples of how we can apply satellite data to water management. It, it is important to consider, for example, the Copernicus products application in support of the United Nations Sustainable Development, Development goals. Copernicus is a powerful instrument to help monitor these indicators and support the implementation of the sustainable development goals. We have an unprecedented amount of data and information generated by these programs that supports decision makers in developing adequate policies to achieve the goals and facilitates the monitoring of the sustainable development goals. Um, it is important to emphasize that it is available on a full free and open basis which contributes to reducing the cost of monitoring indicators and also allows for the development of operational products and services supporting the sustainable development goals. For example, related with the sustainable development goal number 11, sustainable cities and communities. Here we have an, an example, the, um, an example used by the Copernicus Emergency Management Services Service. Um, it provides, in, provides information for emergency response in relations with different types of disasters, including floods, as well as related prevention, prepare, preparedness, response, and recovery activities. As an example of how this service, emergency service supports emergency preparedness and response, 
uh, is the activation of its rapid mapping components following floods in Peru in early 2017. These events resulted in more than 100 deaths, caused the evacuation of around 158,000 people and dam damaged 210,000 homes. And the maps produced by Copernicus Cell Service helped it analyze the affected areas and the extent of the floods in real time, allowing the civil protection authorities to target their, risk, their rescue operations. This is another example to illustrate how the Copernicus products can support the sustainable development goals. For example, uh, related with the SDG 15 life of, of on land, we have this image, a crop land classification around the Sous River in southern southern Morocco. This is an excerpt of the Copernicus Global Land Cover Map and we can add additional layers of uh, irrigation plots that have been produced by FAO's water productivity portal. This is an interesting rain-fed cr cropland and irrigated cropland mapping map using satellite information, mainly Copernicus 2 products. In this segment, we will talk about the geographic information systems, GIS. We can define a geographic information system as a computer system that, that analyzes and displays geographically referenced information. It uses data that is attached to a unique location. Going to share my presentation, most of the information we have about our world contains a location reference. For example, where are water agencies stream gauges located? Where was a water sample sample locate, uh, collected? If, for example, a rare plant is observed in three different places, GIS analysis might show that the plants are all on north-facing slopes that are above an elevation of 1,000 feet and that get more than 10 inches of rain per year. GIS maps can then display all locations in the area that have similar conditions, so researchers and conservation officials know where to look for more of the rare plants or another uh, environmental element. And another example, by knowing the geographic location of farms using a specific fertilizer, GIS analysis of, of farm locations, stream locations, elevations, and rainfall will show which, which streams I like, uh, are likely to carry that fertilizer downstream. It is important, for example, to prevent the water body's uh, pollution. These are just a few examples of the many uses of GIS in air, earth sciences, biology, resource management, and many other fields. For example, in this picture, we can appreciate different layers that compose the national map of the United States. We can find layers related with boundaries, elevation, um, a digital elevation map, geographic names, hydro, hydrography, land cover, 
ortho imagery structures and transportation networks. Over the last 20 years, several authors have used GIS technology as a research tool in order to analyze and solve environmental problems. They had different approaches that can be divided into environmental monitoring and land use, adaptation studies and modeling of extreme climate events, modeling and monitoring the quality and pollution of water, and hydrologic modeling and studies applied to watersheds. On the right, we can appreciate an, orga an organogram that demonstrates in a simplified manner how the three operational levels of the GIS are organized as a decision supported tool. In the structure level, the databases are fed and organized, including all information that may be georeferenced. The interface level includes the visual presentation of the information and several layers of information can be can be overlaid according to the selected topics and the specific goal of analysis. And lastly, in the user level, there are analysis based on the alphanumeric information and other information provided by the layer, layers. To be of value to a um, GIS, data must be processed and arranged in a database in such a way as to be meaningful and consistent to a wide range of users, both in the present and in the future. For the GIS to function, it requires the input in digital form of two sorts of information. In the first place, where an object is located on the map, and the second hand, what an object on the map represents. These two sets of information make up the two main kinds of databases which necessarily must be built up as a part of a GIS. They are commonly referred to as a graphical containing geometric or spatial information and non-graphical containing attribute or feature code databases. It is important to mention that GIS is a way of organizing database records by tying them to geographically synchronized slices of the world so that where questions can be asked an answer. This is an example how we can organize the real world in different data slices. Each slice are related to imagery, elevation, transportation networks, addresses, boundaries, which are features, features, example, uh, streams, rivers, uh, lagoons, and uh, survey control, geodesic networks, and your own data according with your own and specific research and intervention goals. All geographic or spatial entities may be subdivided into only three categories points, lines, and areas. In the case of the points, this can be iman imagined as dots on, on a map. The dot may represent anything which is located in one place. For example, a port, a dock, borehole, water source, etc. It will immediately be noted that whether or not a feature can be represented as a point depends on the scale of the map on which it may be shown. Thus, on a small scale map, for example, one in a million, a town will be shown as a point, but the same town would not be a point on a one and on in 10,000 map. All depends on the scale we are using. About the lines. 
this may represent any linear feature such a such as row, a road, a railway, stream, or a fence. We can add pipeline, a water convenience structure. At most mapping scales, these features will retain their linear form, thus as with points, the degree of detail and generalization will vary with scale. In GIS terminology, the point at width which two lines, also called segments, arcs, chains or links, intersect is called a node. What about areas? These represent two-dimension unitary blocks of surface space. In GIS or spatial analysis jargon, they are, refer they are referred to as polygons. They may be lagoons, mangroves, lakes, wetlands, etc. When shown on maps at a very scale, these features also may also eventually become points. There are two basic data organizational structures, also called modes, models, or formats which GIS programs use for spatial data. One is the vector mode and two, the second, the raster mode. In the vector data, structure points, lines and polygons are all recorded in terms of their geographic X and Y coordinates. We can appreciate a series of objects in specific groups. The actual vector graphical database, which is built up to store the locational information of the mapped entities, points, lines, or polygons, will be in a coded digital format. The allocation of unique identifiers to mapped objects with, will often be based on a hierarchical coding system as shown above. Here we can see that there are major object groups and within each of these there may be various subcategory levels. For example, we have an object group 4000 referred to boundaries. We can use subgroups, for example, 4001 and 1 refers to a national border, 4002 refers to a county boundary, and we can find examples of township boundaries, property boundaries, national park, bo park border, etc. And um, we can see uh, an example a model showing the layers used to construct a basic vector coastal zone map. Consists of vegetation layer, contours layer, land use layer, drainage layer, shoreline, wetlands, etc. And, and all this information is uh, referred to a reference or basic map. On the other hand, we have the raster data structure. This data structure is concerned not with boundaries, but with the space between boundaries. It is sometimes called the grid model because data is stored in a matrix of cells, which themselves may be called pixels. These cells are usually square, but they may be rectangular, triangular, or hexagonal, or indeed any regular shape which is capable of tessellation. The raster data structure is favorite for ma mapping where the main object dealt with are spatially extensive aerial units rather than linear or point units. And we can see a simple vector map having a point, lines, a polygon, entities with their associated topological encoding above. And 
below, we can see the same representation, but represented as a simple raster map plus the run length encoding structure used for data storage. And uh, we can appreciate two different forms uh, to identify and uh, storage in different formats the same information, the same spatial entities. Those are basic definitions about the GIS and their different formats and the different spatial units and entities. Now we will talk about the uh, application, uh, how we can apply GIS tools for territorial intervention, water management, planning, and we will talk about different uh, examples. Geospatial tools, data, and systems can help project stakeholders at all stages of the project cycle. We are talking about uh, rural development projects, water management projects, etc. Benef beneficiaries and other local people can use data enriched maps as an satellite imagery to understand how the project is trying to support them. The maps can enable them to participate more effectively in project planning and implementation. The project field staff can use maps in their work with beneficiaries and other local people. They can more easily visualize the situation in the field and use the maps as a tool in their daily work. And project managers can use maps to help decision makers, partners, and new staff to understand the project quickly. Maps provide a common tool for visualization, visualization and means to identify problems and opportunities uh, and a basis for discussion and decision makers making. And the de development agencies, staff and consultants supervising projects can better understand the rational and spatial extent of interventions, allowing them to provide better guidance and identify potential risks. And in the upper level, national governments and subnational governments, officials and decision makers can easily see the value for money and results from their national operations. They can use this guide, they can use this to guide future rural development interventions. Also, uh, we can apply geo tools for decision makers located at the uh, supranational level, uh, for example, financing and donors and contributor, contributors and supranational development agencies and others. What devices are needed to collect data? Recently, uh, we can use smartphones and tablets to collect data. These devices are easy to use and relatively efficient for collection of GPS coordinates, basic analysis and view, viewing of maps. They are widespread, low cost, portable and have multiple uses, including for communication, photography and video recording. They readily lend themselves to georeferencing project sites, but depending on the device, may may not be very accurate but um an a, an advantage of this device is uh, all the people 
in the rural areas can access to a, a smartphone and this is an advantage. On the other hand, we have specialized GPS handheld devices. These record GPS coordinates more and more accurately than smartphones. But, and projects should preferably use these devices to record geographic locations. They can also capture transects and areas precisely. Various brands and models have different costs and specifications in terms of accuracy and versatility. And recently can uh, appreciate the work of drones or on the field. Drones uh, as an unmanned aerial vehicles. Drone cameras can quickly take a large number of images or video showing both the GPS coordinates and the time and date. They may also show the accuracy of the coordinates. The coordinates can be linked to aerial photographs, videos and satellite images. Drones can be specifically useful for georeferencing rural ro roads, water bodies, bodies, and topographic features. We can add um, water pipelines, other structures as um, uh, rivers, intakes, structures, spring water catchment infrastructure, etc. For example, in this example uh, is about the Georgia, Georgia country, and uh, using a GIS, we can uh, analyze and visualize different elements in the country territory. For example, projects about river ban rehabilitation, projects about irrigation enhancement, where are cooperative uh, projects located, uh, for example, storage of cereals, projects related with young agri-entrepreneurs, projects related with aquaculture, etc., etc. For a um, rural development agency, a GIS is an important and a relevant tool. How is data managed? analyzed and stored. Various software applications are available. In most cases, a combination of different programs for different purposes is used. In the case of uh, data management, QGIS is a free and open source closed platform desktop geographic information system application that supports viewing editing and analysis of geospatial data. We can emphasize that QGIS is a free and open source uh, application or software. You can visit the project site uh, in, the, in this link. On the other hand, RGIS is a commercial geographic information system for working with maps and geographic information maintained by SRI, ESRI. The software package also allows users to create online dashboards and story maps. The disadvantage uh, is uh, you need you must to be subscribed to that a commercial platform. And the third system is Google Earth Pro. It's a freely available computer program that renders a three-dimension representation of the Earth based prim primarily on very high resolution and multi-temporal satellite imagery. It is an excellent tool to visualize data. And recently, Google Earth support different uh, shape and layer 
formats and uh, Google Earth is acquired, acquiring many uh, GIS functions and modules. And we can compare different software and apps using different criteria. Uh, for example, uh, the level of GIS expertise required in the case of Google Earth Pro, it is very intuitive and you don't have a lot of expertise you can use this system. And uh, another criteria related with data management, data analysis, license fees. It is important to emphasize that QGIS don't require license fees. The same for the Google Earth Pro about the capabilities for map creation. But you can use Google Earth to make simplified maps that can help you to uh, transmit information about a project or an a intervention or an idea about a water structure on the field. And the last visualization with satellite, satellite imagery and uh, the Google Earth Pro has a set of high resolution data available. And we can complement the apps mentioned above with this web application that give access to environmental and social socioeconomic data sets. For example, we can mention EarthMap is an innovative online tool host a repository, a repository of models allow, allowing users to analyze the status and trends of, for example, vegetation, climate, fires, land cover, biodiversity, and uh, we can find, we, um, I have included the link uh, earthmap.org. The Global Forest Watch is an online forest monitoring system that allow, allows users to measure and visualize changes to the world's forests. It also hosts useful layers on, for example, indigenous peoples' territories, land cover, climate, and biodiversity. Also, we have included the website link. CEPAL or System for Earth Observation Data Access Processing and Analysis for Land Monitoring is a cloud computing based platform that allow, allows users to access and process satellite imagery without having to download, download any data. You can operate in the cloud environment. You don't need um, a computer with a, a high capacity of processing data, but you can use the processing resources on the cloud environment. Geofolio is a simple web application, grow an area of interest, and this tool generates generates a fact sheet for that area showing land cover, watersheds, climate, topography, soils, etc. This tool is very interesting to generate small and brief reports of an area of special interest. And the last, the Google Earth Engine is a powerful processing platform that hosts a wide range of data sets and draws on enormous computer power. Users do not have to download or processing any data on their own computers. Analysis is done in the cloud environment, but you need Java script or Python programming skills uh, to operate this platform. But 
it, it is a, a powerful platform. It is very used for scientists and researchers, etc. And it is interesting to mention about programs and platforms designed specifically for water management in some regions, watersheds, uh, different territories in Latin America and the world. We know water resources management and planning are among the biggest challenges faced by many countries around the world, including Latin America and Caribbean countries. Most countries in this region present these common challenges. Evaluation, protection, management, and quality of water sources. Lack of quantita quantitative data need to plan under changing conditions. Design, rehabilitation, maintenance of if infra infrastructures. Water resources allocation flood and drought risk management. In order to uh, find a response to these challenges, uh, Inter-American Development Bank has created HydroBid. HydroBid is an integrated and quantitative system to simulate hydrology and water resource, resource, resources management in the Latin American and Caribbean region under scenarios of change. For example, climate change, land use change, population evolution, etc., which allows to evaluate the quantity and quality of water infrastructure needs and the design of strategies and adaptive projects in response to these changes. And here we have a, a scheme about the uh, platform functioning, uh, uh, how this platform functions about the entire and schematic process. We use analytical hydrography data sets with delineate, delineated catchments and stream network. Uh, we have data inputs, uh, several layers of inputs, land uses, soil types, rainfall, temperature, reference streams, reference stream flows for calibration. And then the platform runs a, a model, a rainfall runoff routing model. And then uh, we have time series of projected water flows. We have, uh, we need to add the data inputs related to, with water demand and the value of water. Um, then the platform runs a water allocation model complemented with another platform as a, as WIP platform. We we are gonna going to mention this later. And finally, we obtain a risk analysis and specification for water for adaptive water infrastructure. We can find more information uh, in this link. Uh, some of the advantages using this uh, HydroBit pla platform covers the entire Latin American and Caribbean region, useful to organize and aggregate scarce data, spatial and temporal resolution suited for planning and design of water resource infrastructure simulates basing hydrology driven by climate in a modular, flexible, and scalable way, robust, robust hydrologic model formulation that is able to interact with just about any type of climate model or data source, tailored to 
simulate water resources at all time scales, near term, intra interannual, decadal, and beyond. It, it, is, it is important, an important application for water planners, for water agencies in the region, and developed using web based architecture runs from a browser like app interface and open source designed to be community driven opening the doors to a rich development and improvement process and we can see in the platform we can find information about uh, 270,000 catchments in the uh, Latin American and Caribbean region. And below we have an example, how can we visualize the information running this platform. And uh, we are going to talk about uh, another uh, platform for water management. This is the WIP platform. Uh, WIP is a software tool for integrated water resource planning that attempt to assist rather than substitute for the skilled planner. WIP means water, water evaluation and planning. It provides a comprehensive, flexible and user-friendly framework for planning and policy analysis. Growing number of water professionals are finding WIP to be a useful addition to their toolbox of model databases, spreadsheets, sheets and spreadsheets and other software. WIP operates in many capacities. Water balance database, we provides a system for maintaining water demand and supply information. Scenario generation tool, WIP simulates water demand, supply, runoff, stream flows, storage, pollution, generation, treatment and discharge, and in-stream water quality. And related with policy analysis tool, WIP evaluates a full range of water development and management options and takes account of multiple and competing uses of water systems. This, um, this platform um, is uh, developed by the Stockholm Environment Institute in uh, the US center of this institute, which is the main objective of, of this platform. The main goal is related with uh, our current challenges in the world because freshwater management challenges are increasingly common. Allocation of limited water resources between agricultural, municipal and environmental uses now requires the full integration of supply, demand, water quality and ecological considerations. And the water evaluation and planning system or WIP aims to incorporate these issues into a practical yet robust tool for integrated water resource planning. And we uh, can emphasize that we places demand side issues such as water use patterns, equipment efficiencies, reuse strategies, cost and water allocation schemes, on an equal footing with supply side stopping topics such as streams, stream flows, groundwater resources, reservoirs, and water trans transfers. Uh, we can use all these concepts and integrate all these those concepts in a single uh, tool and we can use WIP to analyze and integrate information related with these dimensions or uh, layers of information. And um, we can find answers to different 
different questions. For example, what if a population growth and economic development patterns change in our region? And another type of question, for example, what if reservoir operating rules are altered or what if groundwater is more fully exploited or what if water conservation is introduced, etc. And uh, finally, we have an example of how we can visualize the different data integrated in the WIP platform. And we can uh, include information about rivers, about the diversion structures, uh, reservoir structures, groundwater uh, intake points or catchment uh, points and other sources for water supply and um, areas for runoff and infiltration and infrastructure for transmission where wastewater treatment plants uh, are, are located, etc., etc. Thank you for your attention. Uh, this is, was the module about geographic information systems related with water management. Well, hello to all of you. My name is Arauco Schiffman. I work in INTA, in INTA IPAF NEA, Laguna Nainek is the town. Formosa is the province. Uh, Argentina is the country. And I will share a presentation uh, with you. Well, I will talk about the module three, water access and use, and the topic does about harvesting water. Specifically, I will talk about the water resources analysis and evaluation and the collection and catchment of surface water and groundwater. In the first place, I will talk about the three components that a, a system of a, collecting water needs to, to, in order to work properly. Um, we uh, have uh, several methodologies for resource diagnosis and survey. Uh, we need to know uh, how and how much water we have in a certain place in order to manage that water properly. So we have in the first place the physical component, uh, then we have the water resource quantity, the quality and the opportunity. Uh, I mean, uh, how much water we have in, in uh, different places, the quality of that water, if, if the quality is for a uh, human consumption or animal consumption or irrigation, the topographic conditions of the place in, in the, where the water is, the spatial distribution, the climate, the soil and the vegetation of that place. The second component uh, that we have is the social component. Uh, how many people are involved in, uh, in different places where the water uh, is uh, required. The requirements of that people, the population growth, the management, the organization, the agreement to use the water, the economics, the humans and material resources, the existing practice and water rights for the uh, correct use of the water. And when we have the two components that I mentioned, we can do a water system design. That is the catchment, conduction, storage, treatment, and distribution infrastructure for the correct uh, water uh, use. Uh, we need to take in mind the, the tax required for the operation and maintenance of the water, the rights and the obligations and the uh, utilization rules. In this slide, I will talk about the quantification of the demand. 
we need to identify the problem, uh, what is the community needs and the technical, and we need to do field trips uh, uh, to know uh, the techniques uh, that we need to do in order to uh, provide, supply the water for that uh, community. Uh, what are the requirements? Uh, domestic irrigation, livestock, individual or community use. So when we have the demand quantification, we can do a quantification of the water availability of that place. Uh, the water resource type, if it's surface water, groundwater or rainwater, and the characterization, the location, the flow, the quality, the interannual and the intraannual variability of the precipitations. Then uh, we need to know the site conditions, the topography, the slopes, levels, distances. And uh, with all that information, we can do an infrastructure and water system technical design. Uh, all of this stuff uh, will uh, allow us to do a water catchment system. Uh, the infrastructure depends on the water source. That's because the, if it's superficial surface water, gaussian station or other techniques to measure flow rate, level, physical, chemical, and biological quality, variability in time. Uh, we have streams, we have rivers, and springs. Uh, if, if we have a groundwater in a certain place, uh, we can do different kind of practices uh, or techniques to do the surface, the, the water extractions. Uh, traditional practices like dowsing or water witches and Q-electric prospection, the vertical electric sounding. And if we only have rainwater, we need to construct roofing and additional structures in order to catch that water. And we need to know the characteristics and the dimensions we, we need to take in mind. The traditional practices, the dowsing of water witches consist in, uh, this is a picture from a experimental station of Inta in an uh, arid place in Formosa, in another town of Formosa, where uh, the people, the farmers don't, don't know any uh, specific uh, techniques uh, expensive techniques. They don't have expensive techniques, so they use this kind of of uh, sticks, or we can use uh, wires uh, to to know the where is the ground water. Uh, you have to believe in this uh, because it's not a scientific method. But uh, you, if you if we have uh, some some funding for do some some research. We can do a geoelectric prospection, the vertical electrical sounding, uh, like this one that we have, like an um, uh, uh, we we can do an electrical uh, uh, state of the of the soil of uh, so we we can uh, search. Uh, uh, resistivity uh, layers. Uh, when we have uh, layers with more uh, resistivity, uh, there's a, is, there is more chance that uh, the water don't flow freely in that uh, layers. So we need to, to, to search for uh, layers with low resistivity. Uh, uh, generally the sand layers. And uh, we have here the rainwater catchment. Uh, 
uh, where we need to do some structure, properly structure uh, with the proper dimensions to, to catch the water like uh, the houses with a thin roof and gutter and uh, conduct that uh, water to uh, cisterns or tanks or anything. Um, when we need to know the, 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 the water that is needed in some place, we need to do a survey. This is the first source of information. Uh, is uh, when we talk to the people and uh, the people say, well, I, I have this, this pump, I have this, uh, this excavation. Uh, the people talk to us, uh, to the technicians, in order to know uh, the capacity, the water capacity, um, the possibilities for store water. Uh, the same for uh, apply for the quality. Uh, how is the water that the people uh, have? Uh, and the localization of the water, the distance to the bathroom, the distance to, to, to grow in areas, etc. Uh, so uh, we can do a project to, to fund a water system uh, for farmers. Um, and also uh, here we have the, the, the need for the, for the animals, a different kind of animal species uh, have different uh, demand for water for drinking water. So we need to plan the water that we need to, to collect and to store for the water consumption of the animals. Um, the same for the people. Here, uh, I can show you some water collection and catchment uh, structures. Uh, as I was saying previously, uh, first, uh, we have the surface water. The surface water consists of rivers and streams catchment using pumping systems and springs protection, like uh, is useful for the Caribbean uh, geography. Uh, we have the rainwater uh, catchment uh, through the roof. And uh, the rainwater can be can be stored also in excavated tanks, farm dams, reservoirs, etc. And additional technologies are the solar distillers, like the picture at your right, uh, is a is a technique to to remove the salt from the water to the sun energy, solar energy and the biosan filter or similar. Uh, here, uh, I can show you some pictures of, the, of some places of Argentina. This is from the, from the Misiones province, where they have similar uh, geographical characteristics, like in the Caribbean countries. They have big slopes, and soils that uh, sometimes don't, don't permit the, the storage of water because uh, they are too sandy. And they use different uh, technologies uh, in order to, to collect the water. This, is the, this case is a groundwater abstraction using drilling wells or boreholes where, the, where, the, where there is uh, in places where there is groundwater, that we know that is groundwater. And this technology is used in the Misiones province, the water collection and catchment from spring protections. This is uh, the, the, the springs are water that emerge at the surface. And we need to do some kind of structures to, in the first place, identify where is the spring and then uh, protect that springs for, um, from uh, contamination 
of different kind of contamination. And then we can conduct, conduct that water to uh, another place to storage. Uh, so there are here we we can we can see the, the the different steps that we need to do in order to protect protect that that spring. Uh, this is a picture from the Misiones province where the, that technology is used in that place. And uh, I want to share with you this kind of, of technology that is used in the Misiones province and how our institution, INTA, uh, helps the people to, to in, the, in the funding of projects, uh, to permit that the people uh, have different kind of, of water for consumption. Uh, this is just an example that in the last five years, more than 300 protect sprints were realized with distribution networks, totally more than 3,200 rural families. Uh, this is a picture of that, of that kind of structure. And these are different pictures of uh, different technologies. This is the, the water wheel that is a, is a technology for pumping water from a river uh, to a, a different places that, they, that are a, at a certain distance. And uh, I will, uh, this, this was my, my presentation and I will I, I want to to, to uh, say thank you very much for your attention and hope that this presentation uh, was useful for you. Thank you. Hello everyone. In this opportunity, uh, we are going to focus in the uh, groundwater component of the water cycle. Um, groundwater is an important natural resource. Worldwide, more than 2 billion people depend on groundwater for their daily supply. And a large proportion of the world's agriculture and irrigation is dependent on groundwater as are a large number of industry. And we can add that many cities and towns uh, around the world um, are dependent on groundwater for water supply. Um, a good manner to start in promoting a holistic approach to uh, linking groundwater and surface water is to adopt the hydrological cycle as a basic framework. Uh, we have mentioned this uh, latest version of the hydrological cycle uh, produced by the USGS and uh, in this opportunity we are going focus on that component of groundwater we can see inside the uh, red square, the hydrological cycle can be thought of as the continuous circulation of water near the surface of the earth from the ocean to the atmosphere and then via precipitation surface, surface runoff and groundwater flow back to the ocean. As we mentioned earlier, humans alter the water cycle in 
different ways. Um, we redirect rivers, build dams to store water, and drain water from wetlands for development. We use water from rivers, lakes, reservoirs, and groundwater aquifers. And we use that water to supply our homes and towns and communities and rural communities. And also for agricultural irrigation and grazing, livestock, and in industrial activities like thermoelectric power generation, mining, and aquaculture. Um, and uh, we use water uh, for many economic activities, for example, uh, tourism uh, and uh, it, it is important to consider also the, the importance of the hydrological cycle and the water uh, to uh, sustain, to maintain ecological services. In the next slide, we have a, uh, we made a, a, a zoom over the red square. And we know that human activities affect water quality in agricultural and urban areas, irrigation and precipitation wash, fertilizers and pesticides into rivers and groundwater. And runoff carries chemicals, sediments, and sewage into rivers and lakes. It is important to consider that climate change is also affecting the water cycle. It affects water quality, quantity, timing, and use. And climate change is also causing ocean acidification, sea level rise, and extreme weather. Through infiltration and groundwater recharge, water moves into the ground. When underground, groundwater flows within aquifers and can return to the surface through springs or from natural groundwater discharge into rivers and oceans. We have here a representation of uh, infiltration processes. Uh, we, we can see the groundwater recharge and how the water circulates uh, through the the, the aquifer. And uh, it, it is important to consider water abstractions. For example, uh, here uh, we can see uh, wells or boreholes or wells pumping water uh, for irrigation uh, and agricultural purposes. What is a spring? A spring is a place where water moving underground finds an opening to the land surface and emerges sometimes as just a trickle, maybe only after a rain, a rain, and sometimes in a continuous flow. Spring water can also emerge from heated rock underground giving rise to hot springs. A spring is a water resource formed when the side of a hill, a valley bottom or other excavation intersects groundwater at or below the local water table.
below which the subsurface material is saturated with water. A spring is the result of an aquifer being filled to the point that the water overflows onto the land surface. They range in size from intermittent seeps, which flow only after much rain, to huge pools flowing hundreds of millions of gallons daily. In this case, we can see a spring in an Andean landscape in, the, uh, in Salta province in northwestern part of Argentina. It is important to recover this concept, uh, what is groundwater. Groundwater is the part of the subsurface water that fully saturates the pore spaces in bedrock, regolith or soil, and so occupies the saturated zone. The water table marks the top of this zone. zone. Above, it is the unsaturated zone in which water does not fully saturate the pores. And here, water is held by capillary tension as thin films on water adhering to mineral surfaces. surfaces. And here we can see the uh, groundwater, the water table as a limit, and above the water table, the unsaturated zone. It is important to consider that groundwater moves slowly in deep paths, eventually emerging by seepage into streams, ponds, lakes and marshes. In these places, the land surface dips below the water table. Streams that flow throughout the year perennial streams derive, derive much of the, their water from groundwater seepage. Uh, this is important because in many arid reg region, regions, when uh, we we are uh, sometimes we are in in the dry season, but but we can see water streams uh, with a considerable considerable stream. Uh, probably that stream is uh, feeded by uh, springs occurrence. Uh, in in the upper zones of the mountain. And here we can see another diagram showing the saturated zone below the water table. And we can see the uh, water table defining the limit between the saturated and unsaturated zone and uh, we can see uh, the capillary fringe where the capillary forces takes place we can see the soil zone and uh, we have a permanent loss of humidity through the evapotranspiration what is an aquifer? An aquifer is best defined as a saturated permeable geologic unit that can transmit significant amount of water under ordinary hydraulic gradients. An aquiclud is defined as a saturated geologic unit that's, that is incapable of transmitting significant quantities of water under ordinary hydraulic gradient. In recent years, the term aquitard has been coined to describe the less permeable beds in a 
stratigraphic sequence or in a stratigraphic column. These beds may be permeable enough to transmit water in quantities that are significant in the study of regional groundwater flow, but their permeability is not sufficient or not enough to allow the completion of production wells within them. Most geologic strata are classified as either aquifers or aquitards. A confined aquifer is an aquifer that is confined between two aquitards. An unconfined aquifer or water table aquifer is an aquifer in which the water table forms the upper boundary. Fine aquifers occur at depth and confined aquifers near the ground surface. For example, in this case, on the right, we have a borehole near the, uh, near the house. Uh, if we consider that these beds above the saturated zones are has uh, have high permeability for example uh, gravels and sand we can assume that this aquifer is a water table aquifer the house inhabitants are accessing to the water to this uh, uh, water table aquifer uh, through a bowl hole and this is a traditional technique to access to the groundwater more specifically the water table aquifer and in the upper uh, segment we can appreciate the confined aquifer that is located between two aquitards or confining units above the above this confining unit we have the unconfined aquifer or water table aquifer and we can see different ways how to access to the confined aquifer artesian will how to access to the unconfined aquifer uh, through a water table well, etc. But the, we need to emphasize that the confined aquifer are located between two aquitards and the unconfined aquifer or water table aquifer uh, is most vulnerable to pollution processes or or to or to be affected by nutrients and other substances. We're going to the next slide. An aquifer is best defined as a saturated permeable permeable geologic unit that can transmit significant amounts of water under ordinary hydraulic gradients. Uh, this is another kind, another diagram to represent, represent the confined aquifer. Uh, for example, this aquifer, this, stra this strata, this horizon is composed of sand and is located between two uh, layers of uh, clay with a, a very low permeability. And above the first uh, layer, layer of clay, we have the unconfined aquifer. And the limit, the upper limit of the unconfined aquifer is the water table. And uh, we 
we will resume the references on spring classification. We have different types of spring classifications. It is important to consider the nature and occurrence conditions of each spring to establish or to propose the best uh, technology or best design for to catch and to put it for, for water catchment when we have a, a, a spring for water supply. Uh, in the first case, on the left, we have the back stowing spring. These springs are formed by an impervious stratum that comes to the surface and their flow and therefore blocks the water from flowing downwards. And for example, in the case of a geological fault, we have a, a hydraulic barrier and the uh, water uh, appears on the surface. In the other case, on the right, we have the mountain slide spring. These springs occur where water disappears into loose rock formations higher up and flows out to the surface at the bottom. We have, for example, this uh, unit of regolith or altered rock with uh, high permeability and the uh, water circulates through this, uh, this unit, uh, this permeable unit and the water appears uh, at the bottom of uh, this unit. We also have the gravity springs uh, that flow on a natural underground slope to the surface. The water flows more or less horizon horizontally out of the ground. We can see he here uh, the point in which the, the water appears uh, on surface. In the right, we have uh, the artesian springs that occur when water is trapped between impervious layers and is forced to the surface under pressure. At these springs, the water comes vertically out of the ground. Um, we have biblio, uh, bibliographical references, in this case, uh, available to, uh, we, we can obtain the, orgi the original document uh, to read more about these topics.